Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Welcoming you here, those who can be with us here this morning, and those who are online, we uh, welcome you. So if you're online today, please say hi and let us know that you're with us here this morning. And uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Amen. Uh, I know we have some people out this week due to surgeries and illnesses and those kind of things. So we uh, we want to lift them up, especially today, and uh, uh, pray that they get back to normal here very, very soon. Uh, join us this Wednesday at 7 p.m. as we continue through on Season 2. We're almost ready to wrap up Season 2 of The Chosen and start in on Season 3. And uh, they had some really neat things on the other night on uh, TBN for any of you guys that are able to catch any of those uh, episodes that, that were running. Uh, they do a behind the scenes. They'll show an episode and then they do the behind the scenes uh, with the rabbis and some of the uh, clergy that help them um, formulate the, the chosen and the episodes and make sure that they're biblically accurate. Uh, the, the rabbi, Jason, uh, goes through and he makes sure that, that it is done properly to the Jewish standards of the day. And it's really, really something to listen to how they talk about that and, and give extra insight into what goes into the chosen. Uh, absolutely awesome. So join us Wednesday, 7 o'clock here, and uh, we'll be uh, trundling on through this next episode of the chosen. Our next men's breakfast is going to be October 7th, which to me, I was thinking, you know, I got a couple more weeks before the end of the month. And then Terry goes and, and drops the bomb on me this morning and says, this is the last week of September. Next Sunday is October 1st already. Uh, this year is just absolutely flying by. So we will be having that next men's breakfast, October 7th. And later on that night, uh, 9 o'clock a.m., be here. Great food, great company. Our next movie, then, is going to be also on October 7th, that same Saturday. We're going to be showing the Chronicles of Narnia, and the episode is Prince Caspian. And so they return to Narnia, and, and uh, everything has changed. Everything that they knew before has been changed. And so it's, it's really interesting to see uh, how C.S. Lewis had written these in there. There's actually a, seven books in the series. And... Uh, if you ever get a chance to read all of them through, it's amazing to see uh, some of the things and how that speaks to even our society today. And so it's pretty, pretty neat. Following that movie, then, the 18th, uh, um, what's that? October 14th. October 14th, season 18, season 18 oh. is coming to a close. <laughs> Uh, so we only have two. <laughs> Sorry, I saw the date. <laughs> no, I was going to say the 18th season for Orange Track comes to a close in November. So we have one more month of regular racing, and then we have the season finals in there. And this will be on October 14th. Registration at 9.30. Racing starts at 10 a.m., so make sure you're there. It's a good time and uh, a lot of great fellowship. So. Let's go ahead and start uh, this time. Oh, yes, and, and Lori uh, brought in uh, cookies this morning here. Uh, those happen to be my dad's favorites, so she brought them in. So he passed on Monday. So. Uh, we do have the visitation the celebration of life at TN Funeral Home from 2 to 5 today, and then the celebration of life at 5 o'clock. So let's go to God in a word of prayer, shall we? <laughs> Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, our world constantly changes, but you, you are our rock. We can always trust in you, and we know that you are there for us, no matter what, no matter what goes on. Lord, we, we stand upon your word today. We trust in your word today, and we just pray, Lord, that you would just overflow us with your blessings today. Bring us into that worship spirit. Fill us full of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we know that you are in this room with us right now, and we can feel your presence. We pray to you and thank you for that. We ask that you would open our ears to hear, our eyes to see the wonders of your world, and our heart to take in that blessing that you have for us, and bringing your spirit into our holy of holies, into our hearts, and live it out daily through us. Guide and direct our spirits. In your name we pray. 
Our call to worship today comes from Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and this is from the uh, NLT, the New Living Translation. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding, and in all your ways submit to him, and he will make your paths straight. And boy, there's, there's a lot to be said there, but it is exactly what I was talking about in the prayer this morning. We need to stand on God because God is immutable. He does not change. He is forever. He is eternal. And his love for us is eternal. His promises for us stand throughout time. And we need to understand that. So trust in the God with all your heart because he will not change. He's there for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And in this passage in Proverbs, it talks about Christian ethics, what we should be doing in our ethics, how, sh how our character is developed. Love and faithfulness are two of those characteristics that we need to understand. Uh, we call them biblical virtues. So love and faithfulness are two biblical virtues, meaning if you want to have your lives lived out wonderfully and according to what God wants in it, those are the things, those are virtues we should adhere to. They're the focal point of the understanding and implementation of all the rest of the virtues that are listed in the scriptures, such as peace and mercy and justice and righteousness. And love, when we talk about love, in the Hebrew, it's chesed. Now that's C-H-E-S-E-D, uh, -E -E chesed. And that is a self-denying readiness to help other people. That's how the Hebrew translates that. And it represents that reciprocal relationship of service beyond just what your social duty would be to your fellow man, but it gives you that next step up above it to how you need to act and react with each other. How your love should translate into their lives and their love translate into your lives. That's what that reciprocal relationship is all about. How we need to love our fellow persons, our fellow man. And hand in hand with that, the other virtue is faithfulness. And in Hebrew, that is chemeth. And chemeth indicates that trustworthiness. We have a bond between each other, that trustworthiness. Reliability and loyalty. And these characteristics are found in people who please God. God will anoint us with those gifts as we please him, as we do service to others. In Hebrew, faithfulness is tied to trust, not just at the service level of trust, but it means you trust the character and nature as well. And it is a level of trust that you're willing to invest your future in. And that's what God is asking here. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. He wants you to invest your trust in him because he is trustworthy. And that, is, that then becomes the basis of our character, of who we are at our very nature. And that is the foundational belief that leads us then to salvation. See, it's all tied together. Love, faithfulness, trust is all tied together to develop the character who God wants us to be. And that will bring us to salvation. God directs the paths of those who wholeheartedly trust in him. So if you listen to this in this verse in here, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. Don't trust in yourself because you don't know the whole story. You don't mean know the bigger picture. Don't lean on your own understanding. Trust in God because he does know the bigger picture. He created it. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. If you do this and you trust in God and you have that faith and you have a love for God, then what does he do? He anoints us with the Holy Spirit to indwell within us, to guide us through our lives. And God wholeheartedly will then anoint our spirit and guide us to our destiny, which is eternity in heaven. Amen. 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 And that's what it's really all about. That's who we are, and that's who we need to be, and that's how we need to live. And so this simple verse in Proverbs, it's, it's only a couple of lines. But those things there tell us exactly how God wants us to act and react and be with one another. Let us pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word stands strong. 
and that your word is in us and lives through us. And Lord, we ask that you would anoint us with that Holy Spirit to live and indwell within us so that we can be guided and directed into the future that you want to have for us, eternal life with you. We praise you and thank you that you've given this message to Pastor Terry this morning. We ask a special blessing on him and that you anoint him to bring forth a message with power and conviction of what you have talked to him about. So many people go through life with confusion and doubt and Lord, we need to have your guidance to get us through those things and to bring us through into your word and into what you want us to be in our lives. And so we just praise you and thank you for this opportunity to hear your word and to live it out each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. So this morning our, service, or our message is called Confusion and Doubt. And for those that have seen the, the, uh, this episode, you'll probably understand why. If you haven't seen it, go out to our website, click on Grow, The Chosen, and there are links right at the top for the apps for Android and Apple, as well as how you can watch online. So I invite you to do that and keep up with us. Now, this morning, I'm, thanks to Lori, I'm quite confused and, and, and doubting because I'm walking up here and I'm seeing these cookies. So there's like chocolate chip, chocolate chocolate chip, M&M cookies, and I'm confused about whether I should have grabbed one on the way, but I doubted it was a good idea since I was going to be giving the message this morning. So that's kind of where we're at. But what is what does it mean to be confused? What does it mean to doubt? Being confused is when your mind is not clear. So my mind was not clear about grabbing those cookies. Confusion is about information. You may feel confused about what's going on. You may feel uh, disoriented and having a difficult time paying attention or remembering or making decisions. See, making a decision about whether to grab a cookie or not. Doubt, on the other hand, is a feeling of uncertainty or skepticism about the truth, reliability, or validity of something. Well, the validity of it was that it was not a good idea, so hence the doubt. But doubt is about decisions. And I made a conscious decision. Leave the cookie alone. You can have one later. You may feel in doubt about what you should do. I've had conversations with different people this week, even today, about things that we should or should not do. And doubt can impact both the mental and emotional state or our activities. When your inability to make a decision is caused by a lack or mismatch of information, you likely feel both doubt and confusion. And as I was researching these terms and trying to really truly get a good grasp on how I can those tie into this uh, week's episode, I ran across this uh, quote from Robert Frost. I'm not confused. Just well mixed. <laughs> Reminded me of a, a something that my mother-in-law often says um, when she's talking about whether she's sure of something or not. So it's it's taking and, and just changing the way things are. In this episode, we the the disciples and the followers of Jesus are full of both confusion and doubt. And part of that is they're just still trying to get things figured out. Have you ever been in that situation where you were just trying to figure things out? In this episode, at the beginning, we join Simon, Andrew, James, and John on the shore, and they're getting ready for a competition. There are all four of them are holding rocks, and what they're basically trying to decide is which two are going to stay and which two are going to go out and fish for food. Now, Jesus had sent all four of them out to fish. All four. It didn't say make it a competition and two of you can come back. So they devised their own understanding of what it was going to be. And so what did they do? They had these rocks and one of them says, well, shouldn't we throw them on shore? And No, let's throw them out into the water because then we can see the splash and determine that. And so you know how boisterous Simon has been. So he he winds up and he chucks his rock and Andrew throws his and then James and John get up there and 
best than both. And off go the Zorax and off go James and John back to camp. But before they do, you can imagine, you can, if you've seen this series, if you've even seen one episode of this series, you can hear Simon in your head going, um, best two out of three? Have you ever done that with somebody? Best two out of three? Come on. You know, you're flipping a coin for something. Best two out of three? Come on. James and John get back to the camp. And he's giving instructions as he prepares for what he's calling the big event. This big event is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Now, for those of you who've been with us since uh, the very first service or been with us since 2018, you'll remember in the fall of 2018, we did a series called Sermon on the Mount. This was after months of doing foundational faith sermons, setting it up for that. And then for those of you uh, that are watching online, you can click the link uh, that Mark's going to be putting into the, the chat there. But if not, just go out to our website, gracestreet.church, click on messages, and right there at the top, is a link to Sermon on the Mount sermon series. This is before we did video. So it's all audio recording. So uh, you can just click on them and listen to each one in the order that they are there. But back to our message this morning. So as Jesus continues to give instructions, here come the sons of thunder, James and John. And after a bit of ribbing, Jesus says, everyone has a part to play in the execution of this sermon. In those words, <coughs> take that and think about every single message that we do here, whether it's on Sundays, it's on Wednesdays, it may be something that we post online. All of you, everyone that sees those and hears those has a part to play in the execution of that message. Jesus goes on to say, here is what I want each of you to understand and what I want you to what and what I want you to make sure that everyone else understands as well. It's the why of this sermon. See details matter. But the message, that's the most important part. As we're watching this episode, we see Matthew, as James and John come back, and then he wants to fill them in on what's going on. So he whips out his paper and he starts going in. He starts listing off who's doing what. And Jesus is like, Matthew, they don't need to know all of that. And he goes back to talking to them. This message that he's preparing, this big event that Jesus is preparing, he says, will speak to each and every person who will be speaking truth. And that's what Jesus focused on, and that is what we focus on here at Grace Street Church. We focus on truth. Throughout this episode, we see truth get twisted by the religious leaders as they sink Seek to find a way to bring charges against Jesus. We can put this into our daily lives. We see the truth twisted all day, every day. We see things taken out of context and twisted to mean what other people want it to mean. That's why Mark and I are so adamant. Read around the text to understand what it is. Study it yourselves, and if you have questions or something doesn't make sense to you, ask. We want to have those discussions. We want you to understand where that's coming from. We want you to know that we are biblically focused on Christ. Now, we've discussed before the different ways in which the chosen portrays events. Those are biblical events, Events are people who are not in the Bible, but not opposed or against what is in the Bible. And then there's events or, or people in the chosen that specifically contradict maybe what is in the Bible. These things are done. They, they're right up front about this is to fill those gaps about that story. I mean, we, talk, we met Jesse last week, who was healed 
after being crippled for what 30 odd years he was Jesus told him to pick up his mat now that particular instance did happen where he told a uh, someone who was lame to pick up their mat and go. But the way that the story folded together was different. This episode is more of the second type. As, as we see the Roman soldiers come and take Jesus for questioning. As Jesus is giving instructions, he looks up and he sees Roman soldiers coming. Now, with those Roman soldiers is another figure that we don't read about. His name is Atticus, and think Roman CIA, kind of. He's part of the government alphabet soup, if we will. And he is talking about the things that he has seen or heard that Jesus has done. I have to wonder, as I watch him say this and see the look on his face, is he leaning towards Jesus? Are the things that he's seen and heard causing him to doubt his current belief system. He's quite intrigued, and he's not sure what to make of Jesus. He says this, he says, he doesn't strike me at all as threatening or scary. And that's what scares me. Before they get to Jesus, we see Simon and Andrew fishing and arguing, and it's quite interesting, the change that we see in Simon. All of a sudden, a more reasonable person. As he tries to calm Andrew down. But then as he sees the Roman soldiers, Andrew's faced away. And he says, don't turn around. Take a deep breath. But as soon as he starts saying this, Andrew turns around and goes into a panic because he sees those same Roman soldiers. They pull on the nets and they start rowing back to shore. It would appear that um, John the Baptist may have rubbed off a little bit on Andrew. Very outspoken, ready to say thing, what's on his mind, be a little bit jumpy. But as Simon and Andrew continued to talk, Andrew was actually more worried about the religious leaders arresting Jesus, not the Romans, and the plot twist that we see in this episode. When the others turn to look and see what Jesus is looking at, they start to panic. Can you imagine what might be going through their minds at this point in time? What's about to happen? Why are they coming? I can think of, you know, Simon, as he has now been <coughs> had his, his knife taken away from him by Jesus and thrown into the water. His training as a zealot kicked in. And he's ready. And James and John have, they're ready to pull out their knives and their, their weapons. But they're in a panic. As Mark was talking about in our call to worship this morning, they were not leaning, they were leaning on their own understanding and not listening to Jesus. Because Jesus says, Don't be afraid. They aren't even here yet. Jesus says, Don't be afraid. Tell everyone to keep planning. I'll be back. And I don't know why, every time I watch this episode or read that spot, I think of Arnold Schwarzenegger saying, I'll be back. You know? and, but he was serious about that. He would be back. But did they truly believe that he would be back? The Romans are taking him. The Romans take you? You don't usually come back. You either go to jail and then get crucified or you just get crucified. But their mindset was still that they were at war with the Romans, even if the Romans didn't know it. Jesus told them to wait for him and to continue preparing for his big sermon. Being told that it would be okay and that he would be back, it just didn't click. Have you ever had that where you told someone something 
and it just didn't click? Or have you been told something and it didn't click? So this is where they're at. Instead of, they worry, they fret, they're confused, and they doubt. Now, after watching this episode on Wednesday night with everyone and seeing how they acted before Jesus was taken away and after, it reminded me of the difference between backyard wiffle ball and organized little league. One is organized and disciplined with a leader, and the other, well, that's just plain chaos. That's the difference. They were oh, fine when Jesus was there, but things got chaotic when he left. And if you haven't watched this episode, they don't get much done after Jesus is taken away. Not at all. Now, question is, could this or would this have ever happened to Jesus? Not likely, because as I mentioned before, they are not going to bring him in, question him, and then let him go. That's just not the way that the Romans work. But what this storyline does is it helps us to see how we need to trust in what Jesus tells us. There's a message in this. And as they left the camp, or as he left the camp, they were arguing and they were playing the blame game. And I loved it when Jesus' mother Mary says, Boys, stop it. You're acting like children. And they're like, what? Chunk? They're like, how dare you? They really were looking at this elder mom, Jesus' mom, and like kind of pulling a whatever attitude with her. Then Mary, who's full of remorse for having left for a few days and the reasons that she did and, and leaning on her own understanding and doing the things that she did, she says, I made a mistake leaving camp. I was wrong. I'm sorry I relied on my own observation, my own understanding so heavily. But in being forgiven by Jesus, she turns to leave and Mary and Rama will follow her, but she says Jesus said he will be back. She at that point was learning to not lean on her own understanding, but to lean on what Jesus was telling her. And that's why the call to worship was chosen this morning. It's a teaching on trusting God and not ourselves. Verses 5 and 6 are the beginning of a section that in the Passion Translation is called Wisdom's Guidance. But if you look in like the NLT or the NIV, the whole chapter is about trusting in the Lord. Passion Translation says it this way in verses 5 through 10. He says, Trust in the Lord completely and do not rely on your own opinions. With all your heart, rely on him to guide you and he will lead you in every decision you make. Become intimate with him in whatever you do and he will lead you wherever you go. Don't think for a moment that you know it all. For wisdom comes when you adore him with undivided devotion and avoid everything that is wrong. Then you will find the healing, refreshment your body and spirit long for. Glorify God with all your wealth, wealth, honoring him with your first fruits, with every increase that comes to you. Then every dimension of your life will overflow with blessings from an uncontainable source of inner joy. God uses his wisdom to guide us on this path. Solomon in this proverb is telling us that to receive God's wisdom, we must seek his will in all that we do. We must turn over every single part of our lives to him. A thousand years later, Jesus emphasized the same truth in Matthew 6, 33, when he said, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. Jesus gives us a positive alternative to worry. We all can use a positive alternative to worry. In a training this past week that I facilitated, I was teaching them on how to talk 
about a specific hard subject that has been a, a constant as technology changes. And I told the participants in this training, I said, I can't worry about what other people think of me. I just don't have the bandwidth, I don't have the time, I don't have the energy. Because they're mad at the situation, not at me. Reminds me of when Jesus said in Matthew 10, 22, and all nations will hate you because you are my followers. But everyone who endures to the end will be saved. He's telling us that we won't be hated necessarily for who we are, but be, uh, apart from being in Christ. The non-believers will dislike us because of our faith in Jesus. Seeking the kingdom above all else means that God is first in every aspect of your life. So think, filling your thoughts with his desires, taking his character as your pattern in your life, serving and obeying God in everything. We have to make a conscious decision every minute of every day to choose God first because what happens when we don't? Satan's got his little foot in the door and he tries to get in. We are to glorify God with everything we do. When I wake up in the morning, it's like, God, let's honor you today. No matter what I run across or come across, Father, may it bring glory to you. And may I be able to treat people as your son does. This is the practice of giving God the first and best portion, not the leftovers. It is more than what you give financially. Now, this is not a message about off giving or offerings, but it is more than what you give financially. Because so many people give God what's left over. I'm talking about paying all your bills and then whatever you have left over, you give to God. I was there once. And when we shifted from giving God what was left over to giving God our first we had everything we needed the bank account didn't go down it's amazing how God works but it's about saying also to God that he is the most important thing you could say that giving to God helps us to conquer greed and properly manage the resources that he has given to us because yes, when we moved our giving to the front of the line, we reevaluated what we were spending the rest of our money on. This trust helps us to conquer confusion and doubt. Trust was still something that the disciples were working on and it's still something that we all tend to work on. I will never forget Although most of you don't know that at one time I used to have the terrible, awful habit of smoking. And 22, 23 years ago I quit. Told Diana quit. It was all good. Until it wasn't. It wasn't the final quit time. And my doctor called me out on it. And because I signed a little piece of paper that said she could tell Diane whatever about my health, she told Diane whatever about my health. I still signed that piece of paper, though. And that broke a trust because I told her I'd quit. And it took a long time to rebuild that trust. So trust is not something easily gained. Now, when I quit 23 years ago, that was the last. I don't want to have that again. Now, as far as the disciples, they were still set on doing things their own way, blaming others when things didn't go as planned. Have you ever seen that? Can't, people just cannot take responsibility for their own actions. Let's blame somebody else for it. And that's exactly, they're all standing under this awning and in a circle, and it's like, pointing fingers and blaming. It's just, uh, it's crazy. They were just, they, oil and vinegar, I mean, or oil and water, they just were not getting along. They were fighting.
fighting and they were blaming each other for everything that was going on and they were not doing what Jesus had said to plan. Plan for this big event. Plan for this sermon. Now it was after dark when Jesus finally returned. I think they were a bit surprised. They weren't planning on it. In fact, we can see Simon the Zealot, or as he said, I'm not a zealot anymore, I'm just zealous in the episode. He's standing out in front of this awning. Eyes just going across the horizon. Watching for what's coming. It's dark out, and so his eyes have adjusted so he can see a little bit. But they're still in the same mindset as when Jesus was taken away. When he gets back, Jesus tells them that the Romans did not see him as a threat. And of course, Simon, still arms crossed, says, hopefully that'll change soon. He's still in that mindset of the military overthrow the Romans. John then asks, what were you doing out here? And Jesus tells him that he was praying, reminding them of the big event. And this brought some discontent that he first went off to pray before he let them know he was back. Have you ever had somebody that went away, a friend or a family member that went away that didn't tell you as soon as they got back and it was like, what were you doing? Why didn't you call me? Why didn't you we do that with our girls, I, I, I will admit it. Why didn't you tell us you got home on time, you know, made it home safely? Because, you know, they have an hour or two to drive home. Are you worry, parents? Even when you've got adult kids and you shouldn't have to worry, you do. But why didn't you tell us you were back first? And Jesus reminds them of what he had told them before leaving. That he would be back and to keep planning. It's in this moment that Jesus tells them that things are going to get more difficult. And that good or bad, we cannot shut down out of fear. How many people do you know, including yourself, shut down out of fear. I'm guilty. But there is some foreshadowing that they will have to learn to do this on their own when he is gone. He's preparing them. At work, uh, when I was a leader, I always prepared someone to take my place. Whether that be was because I leave that company or I was going to get promoted, I always wanted to make sure that there was someone to take my place, and that is what Jesus is teaching. Simon, speaking for the group, says, we will do better. Jesus is now gone. For now, are we doing better? <laughs> are we living in confusion and doubt, or are we relying on God to show us away. Well, it's at this point that Jesus is asked to give them a similar prayer to what John had given his followers. They want to know more about what Jesus is saying when he is out alone. And their curiosity has kicked in. And at this point, Jesus says, now, now you're behaving like true students. And he says this, Prayer is the first step in getting the mind and the heart right. This, this is what I like to see. And prayer is the first step in getting the mind and the heart right. It is why you see me go to it so often. Scriptures. Do not, he is not, this is not adding to the scriptures. Jesus would constantly go out by himself and pray and spend time with the Father. This is important. And then they said, teach us to pray. So I'm going to have them put up uh, Matthew 9 and through 13 up here in just a moment, but right now, that's why. <laughs> but it says, when you pray, starting at verse 5, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself. Shut the door behind you and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father who sees everything will reward you. 
when you pray, don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Jesus concludes this, uh, this section. He says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sins. See, at this time, the Jewish people would pray regularly at 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., along with several times of public prayer throughout the day. In this episode, as uh, we see some of the religious leaders walking, we see religious leaders, like, just a few feet apart from each other, praying. And they're praying, and they're doing it out loud, and they're doing it just to be seen. But when I liked it when they showed them walking into a building, and there's when he's sitting there praying, and they start to ask him a question, he gives them the hand, he starts praying again, they start talking, he gives them the hand again. The prayer was so important, but not for the reasons God would want it. When it comes to the religious leaders, I'm not actually sure how much of it was for God, but rather to bring attention to themselves, and I would say it was probably to bring attention to themselves. See, prayer can be a very personal and private discussion between you and God. It can also be a public prayer, as we do during Bible study and during worship. We we're missing Denise today. She had rotator cuff surgery on Thursday, and she's healing. When she comes up here and she prays over this ministry, over this church, and over the people, she is not doing it to be seen or heard publicly. She is raising it up between us and God, speaking on our behalf to God. It's all about that conversation with the Lord. It is heartfelt prayer. Nothing hypocritical about it. And Jesus, in this section, was calling out the differences between a hypocritical and a heartfelt prayer. It's about the motive behind the prayer. You could even say this about some of the pastors and preachers in our churches today. They're up there to say, look at me. I have this wisdom that you don't have, and I'm going to give it to you because I'm better than you. I can tell you much that Mark and I stand behind this pulpit knowing that is not the case. God has ordained us to bring messages to you, but they're out of humbleness. And Mark has said this many times, and so have I. These messages are just as much or more for us than they are for you. That's how God speaks to us. When praying in public, our focus should be on addressing God not in how we are coming across to others. In teaching us to pray, Jesus encourages us to be persistent with a sincere heart. It's the shallow repetition of shallow words that he condemns. So before you start to pray, check your heart. We need to pray with sincere and honest hearts. We need to mean what we say. In giving us this prayer, Jesus is providing us with a pattern of prayer to imitate and duplicate. And just very quickly, going to go through that with you. It's we praise God to His or for His work in the world. We pray for our daily needs, not wants, needs. We pray for our daily struggles because we all have different struggles. When He says, "Our Father in heaven." He is saying that God is not only majestic and holy, but also loving and personal. 
And we must be careful to use God's name respectfully. If not, we are not remembering his holiness. When we say, may your kingdom come soon, Jesus is re referencing the spiritual kingdom, not freedom from Rome. May your will be done is in reference to God's work in the world, which is done by those who are willing to obey. It is in this part that we are offering ourselves as doers, asking God to guide us, lead us, and give us what we need to accomplish in his purposes. And he may not speak that directly to you, but he may be using someone in your life to speak that message to you. Give us today the food we need says that we are acknowledging and trusting God as our provider and sustainer. Part of having sincere hearts is repenting of our sins and also forgiving those who have sinned against us. And yes, there will be times that we are tempted. By praying to not let us yield to temptation, we are asking God to show us the way out. There's a passage in 1 Corinthians 10 that gets misconstrued all the time. So it basically, people are saying, God's not going to give me more than I can handle. Bupkis. He will give you more than you can handle. But he will give you a way out. In 1 Corinthians 10, 12 and 13, he says, If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand when you are tempted. He will show you a way out so that you can endure. Jesus said, continue to prepare. I will be back. He gave them a way. He showed them a way out, a way to endure. And the, there's a warning in the passage from Proverbs, or passage from Matthew, it gives us a warning or about forgiveness. It says, when we don't forgive others, we are saying we are better than them. When we ourselves are sinners in the same need of forgiveness, it's just like the disciples and, and the followers there that were arguing back and forth. When we forgive others, we realize what forgiveness actually means. It was in Mary's receiving forgiveness from Jesus that she truly began to understand what it meant and not to lean on her own understanding. Paul tells us in Ephesians 4.32, instead be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. And while the phrase, check yourself before you wreck yourself, comes from a 90s rap song, it rings true in that we need to examine our own actions. Worry about your own actions. At the beginning of this episode, Jesus' disciples and followers were, well, they were in their own heads. They were leaning on their own understanding of the world. They were full of confusion, full of doubt. But by the end, they were learning to be more confident and trusting. They were beginning to understand what it means to trust the Lord with all your heart and not lean on their own understanding. It was in asking Jesus how to pray that they were seeing what it meant to seek his will. And when we do, that he will show us the way. Father, I thank you that in your great wisdom, through your word, you show us the way. Father, you, you gave me a, a great devotion this morning in that when you were telling me about the Old Testament being kind of like a, a dark room with furniture and, and paintings on the wall and all these things. And the Old Testament was kind of like trying to make your way around that room. But that the New Testament, when Jesus comes, he is the light of the world. He brightens that room and we can see everything. And through his teachings, your message becomes clear. We go from you asking Adam, where are you? To the end where you say, come. So Father, at this time we invite all those that are here today, watching online or will be seeing this someday in the future, to come and see what you have prepared for us. Thank you, Father. Do not let us lean on our own understanding, but let us 
lean on you, trusting in you to show us the way. In Jesus' name. We come into this time of communion this morning. I want you to think about what message you had just heard from Pastor Terry and, and to think about what he was trying to say to the disciples and, and to each one of us and to anyone who sees or reads that passage in the future. He says, I want to know what is the intent of your heart. The Pharisees were praying openly in public and calling attention to themselves. But when you pray, you're supposed to be calling God to come in communion with you, to come into a relationship with you. That's what prayer is about. It's not about putting on a public spectacle. It has to do with the intent of the heart. When Jesus went to the cross, it was the intent of his heart to show that never-ending love, to show passion and compassion for those who are sinners, to release them from those bonds, the intent of his heart was to give us salvation. Intent of the heart means everything. So as we come into this time of communion this morning, we are here to commune with God at this time. We are here to tell him what the intent of our heart is. See, when, when he was given up, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. Participate in the sacrifice. And later on in the meal, he took the juice and he blessed it and he said, This cup is the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. Participate in this salvation. He's calling us today as we come into this time that we are to gather together to participate. The intent of our heart should be to remember the sacrifice that Christ made for us and to participate with him in salvation. He gave us his life for ours. Literally and figuratively both. So as we take our communion this morning, let us remember the intent of Christ's heart when he went to the cross for us. The body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Thanks be to God. So as we come into our time of prayer this morning, as you recognize I am not our prayer warrior, Denise. She's at home recuperating from her surgery, and so we want to lift her up in prayer. Um, do we have other prayers we need to have lifted up this morning? Okay. Uh, Becky's granddaughter, Chloe, is sick, and she's been crying all night long, and so we just lift her up to, to have relief from that and a, a quick healing of what is ailing her. Uh, prayers for Deb and Joe's grandson. He had surgery this week, and so we ask that he would be healed and <coughs> recuperate very, very quickly. Of course, Denise with her shoulder surgery, want, we want uh, healing and recuperation. Uh, we lift up Joe for his continued healing from his surgery and <coughs> prepping that mindset then to go in and, and have the next knee done uh, here in October. Uh, prayers for Jennifer to return to treatment and to help get her life back on track. Um, prayers for uh, my brother-in-law Bill for his leukemia uh, so that the treatments um, will be effective and that he'll be with us for a while to come. And we ask for our entire world to be lifted up out of the mire that we're in right now. It's it's a terrible thing, and, and Lori came home the other day and turned on the news, and I just, I just couldn't listen to it anymore. And I just, I, I left the room and shut it off because it was just horrible. There was no good news there; it was all negative. 
everything was negative. And so we just lift this world up to you, this broken world, that in the midst of all these things going on in the world today, Lord, that your will would be done. Your will would be done. Not those of the men, not those of, of those who are in power trying to crush those who are not in power. Lord, give us this blessing today that we ask that you would just come in and do a mighty work in this life. Come in and do a mighty work in this world. Give us that intent of our hearts to be in communion with you and that we would be able to join with you in prayer and to join into that relationship. Lord, when we pray over these elements of, of the bread and the juice, we pray that those who partake of it would come into a complete and total relationship with you and that their lives would be changed. And furthermore, that they would remember the sacrifice that Christ made for them. And so, Lord, we lift all of that up to you today. And we ask for your cleansing. We ask for your healing. We ask for your peace and your comfort and your guidance in our lives. To do your work and your will in our lives. Not leaning on our own understanding. In Jesus' name. message this morning as it was, I think it only fitting that we join together in prayer, together, as we close the online section of our service today. Join me in reciting the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For those of you that are online, check the link in the, the chat for the videos for the worship this morning. Thank you for joining us this morning. We pray that you could join us in person next week.